So thank you, uh, Dr. Chen. Uh, and uh, okay, now, so let's see. I have uh, 15 minutes, right? I think 15 minutes. Okay, all right, good. Uh, now, so uh, in the past uh, uh, six years, uh, I've been uh, focusing my research on the gamified uh, learning. Uh, I, I built game uh, and also build gamif gamification platform, uh, Q&A platform, uh, uh, borrowing element from, from games uh, that make it uh, fun. Uh, so basically, uh, that's what I've been doing in recent years. And so today, I'll talk about um, the, such application in the uh, primary school uh, level uh, to gamify the learning of reading. Uh, so, so this is uh, uh, something called Reading Battle uh, uh, that I developed. Uh, actually, it was released uh, uh, more than five and a half years ago, but it's still going strong. Uh, currently, there are more than 8,000 students uh, from over uh, 40 uh, local schools uh, uh, who are using it. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the first uh, page uh, for, my, for my gamification platform. Uh, that the students can uh, they, they can search uh, search by title author and so on, or they can uh, browse uh, so that will be uh, an application of uh, knowledge from uh, information and library science uh, and then the, uh, i'm also a children 's story author uh, I, I wrote a, a um, number of uh, children 's stories uh, quite some time ago uh, and, and I borrow ideas from that, and I also teach children literature. So, so this uh, different category of a uh, children book yeah, uh, is from children literature. Um, so students will, uh, they need to read first before they can get on the system. Uh, uh, and actually, that's the trick. Now because for many uh, primary school students, especially for, especially for the younger one, they, they, many of them wouldn't think of learning. Uh, they, they just want to have a good time. Uh, yeah. uh, so um, I basically uh, uh, try to satisfy this uh, uh, psychology uh, of uh, young children uh, that uh, I build a, a pretty interesting uh, platform uh, to them to attract them. Uh, uh, but then, uh, although they want to play here, uh, but then before they play, they need to read. Uh, and so, so this trick uh, motivated many, many students uh, uh, to, to change from uh, not reading or, or reading very little in the past. Uh, and because of this, uh, they, they begin to read uh, a lot more. Uh, and, and then uh, after reading, then they get on to my platform, they answer questions, uh, challenge others. Uh, then the, they read again, uh, they discuss through that process, uh, then the, they learn uh, how to read. And then this is uh, some of the rules that I set uh, for my gamified platform. Um, now, uh, many, many of you certainly remember TSA. TSA uh, is a standardized uh, uh, academic uh, test uh, administered at the primary three level. Uh, now, several years ago, uh, parents and kids, they, they were demonstrating on the street yeah, because uh, uh, many of them felt that uh, the kids are not learning anything. Uh, they are just being drilled and drilled and drilled uh, with exercise, a meaningless exercise, very boring. Uh, yeah. uh, but wh why, why were school doing it? Because uh, uh, that, that, that kind of drilling uh, can, can help kids uh, do better in that TSA test. And, and the score uh, that student got uh, is actually almost regarded as the report card of the principal. And that's why a principal pushed that to the teacher, teacher push that to the kids. Now, in a way, uh, my, my system, uh, the content, the Q&A part, in fact, uh, is not much different from T TSA. But then TSA parents hated it, children hated it. But for my platform, children, many of them, they love it. Why? Because I gamify it. Huh. Now, so here are some of the rules uh, that I set. Uh, that, uh, now, TSA, you, you, you only answer each question once, but here, uh, you answer. You, you you can answer each book three times, and each question you can answer it two times. Of course, there has to be some deduction of marks, huh? and all this is gamification. And so, to students, they they don't they don't feel this as a as a test. Huh? They feel it as a challenge, and also that uh, everyone can be successful as long as they work hard. Huh? 
Now, and also that um, uh, I apply scaffolding support uh, 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 that I learned from education. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, when student answer something incorrectly, uh, don't, don't, don't say to the student, oh, you are wrong, uh, yeah, you got zero grade. Uh, but rather, give, give the student some support. Uh, tell the student uh, which page, if, if it is a, a very simple book, or which range of page uh, that they can go explore, try again, uh, find the answer. And also that I give students immediate feedback. Uh, this is also very important. So that, that the learning is uh, uh, close to real time, uh, more or less. Mm. Okay, now, and then the, uh, here's the uh, leaderboard uh, of all the students who have ever uh, used my platform. Now, then it's quite amazing if you look at this. Now, the top student, uh, primary six student, has already consumed over 500 books. Uh, uh, and then on average, the student probably has answered 15 questions per book. Uh, so he has done a lot of things, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, the student got 97 out of 100. Now, you need to understand that uh, most of these activities, so we are talking about maybe on average 90% of the, of the activity here, they are not homework. Uh, they are done voluntarily because children, children find the fun of doing it. Uh, uh, and then, the, and then uh, now, you, you, you may be interested to know, well, then, the, how, how would this impact? Uh, on students' reading ability. Uh, um, now, for one of the sharing uh, that, uh, that the students uh, did, um, uh, a, mom, a mom was sharing that uh, for his uh, uh, primary uh, four uh, child, uh, he, he, he doesn't read, not even books at the kindergarten level. Uh, but because the platform attracted him, so he began to read with uh, level one uh, books in my platform. Level one book is uh, uh, primary one books in Hong Kong, uh, and then within five months, uh, he, he caught up to level one, two, three, four. Uh, that means uh, he self-taught himself four years of reading curriculum in five months. Uh, how is that possible? Because uh, in, in the interview, the mom told me that uh, one day uh, her son took home 16 books. <laughs> now, he didn't, he didn't take home 16 books every day. Not even every week, because I checked the statistics. Uh, for those five months, he actually consumed about 60 books. Uh, but even just for 60 books, it's already sufficient to help this poor boy uh, with a very low reading ability to catch up from grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, grade 4. Uh, uh, and so this thing actually has changed the life of many, many children in Hong Kong. And actually are brought to, it also has been used by Taiwan and the United States, Cambodia, uh, and mainland China to a certain extent. Um, and, and also that uh, uh, in, in many of those uh, sharing, um, uh, the mother, the children will be saying that uh, not only that they are better in reading, but they are also better in writing. Uh, and also that uh, many also uh, score a lot better actually in many uh, academic, uh, in, in many courses. Huh? Um, And also that uh, some of my study also uh, investigate whether gamification will bring a long-term effect now. Now that's always been the question uh, in the past five and, a, five and a half years. In fact, uh, I would say, I will say most, of, most of my colleagues uh, still don't believe in gamification. Uh, they think this is something uh, not very good. Uh, the effect is temporary really, and also can be even harmful. Uh, why? Now because uh, uh, many people think that um, you use a game, uh, you use awards to attract uh, the kids to do what you want them to, to do, like in here is reading. But once they don't have the game to play anymore, when, when they stop receiving award, they will go back to normal. Uh, now I actually uh, did a study and see whether students will go back, go back to normal. Uh, yeah. uh, so I uh, studied those students who have uh, used uh, reading battle quite a lot, and then that they also have stopped using it for uh, one term, two term, that means half a year or a year, huh? uh, then I, I, I survey, I interview them and see whether uh, uh, their reading level and interest are before using reading battle, during using re reading battle, and after stopping using it for half a year or a year. Huh? Now, interestingly, I find that uh, 
uh, for, for those who have used a lot, so that means uh, the reading interest and ability have gone up quite a bit, okay? Uh, let, let's assume uh, from one to five. Uh, one is lowest, five is highest. Uh, let's say they, uh, a, a child improved from level one to four um, during using reading battle. And then after stopping it for a while, it dropped a little bit, maybe to three, but you, you won't drop all the way back to one. Uh, and, and basically it happened to all, all, all the children. That means a good gamify platform can be kind of a uh, long-term uh, benefit for the children. It doesn't necessarily go back to normal, uh, yeah, or go back to the past. Uh, it depends on how you gamify it, how you set up the award. And also that, uh, I also investigate the idea of flow. Yeah, because um, if students uh, uh, spend so much time to consume uh, 400 books, 500 books, uh, they probably have entered a state of flow uh, that uh, they are kind of uh, engaging in their task uh, so thoroughly that the forgetting seems like forgetting uh, uh, the time uh, and space. Uh, they they just enjoying so much. Uh, and uh, now let me see. Uh, now so for my reading battle, I basically apply uh, the very basic, simple uh, uh, game mechanic like pawns, uh, e badges, level leaderboard, um, and. Even for, for so simple uh, game mechanic, uh, then it can already work like magic. Okay, now I, I don't have time to show you what is flow like. I assume uh, you all know what is flow like. <laughs> uh, and uh, now, so these are my question. That uh, are there any major differences in the flow experience between heavy user and light users on my platform? And how does the gamified learning platform affect primary school student flow experience uh, in a leisure reading. And then the, I use mixed method. I got two groups of students. So the heavy users are those who have uh, consumed 60 or more books. And light users are those uh, who use, uh, who has only done one book or less. Huh? Okay, now. And then the, I guess uh, what's interesting is uh, this diagram. Uh, now, so, oh, okay, maybe here. Now, so here, uh, first of all, com compare for among the heavy users, those who have uh, consumed 60 books or more. Um, now, before, you, before uh, reading battle, uh, according to the nine dimension of uh, flow, uh, then the, they are like this, okay? Now, after using reading battle for about a year, two terms, then the, uh, their, uh, their level of flow uh, according to different elements, are like this. Now, and, and then the, you, you notice that um, eight out of nine uh, dimension of flow, uh, all the students who have engaged reading battle uh, quite heavily for a year, they all enhance uh, in the level of flow. Uh. Now, and then another comparison, very interesting. Now here I compare uh, for those who, okay, this is before reading battle. Uh, yeah. Before reading battle, uh, the heavy user, uh, this, this are their level of flow, okay? Now compared to those who, who, who didn't really use reading battle, uh, their level of flow are all higher, all higher than, than, than those who use reading battle. Uh, I mean, before, before those heavy users start using reading battle, all nine dimensions, they are higher. But after a year of using reading battle, uh, then the heavy user of, of, of reading battle, then they actually experience a higher level of flow in the same nine dimension than those who didn't use reading battle. So what that means is a, a good gamified platform actually can also in, in, induce flow learning for students mm. or higher flow learning experience for students. Uh, I, what, what's my time is like? <laughs> Almost done, okay, no problem. Now then, the, uh, okay, well, this is just some qualitative uh, data. Uh, the, the first dimension of flow autotelic uh, refers to activities carried out for their own sake. Uh, um, and uh, so students in the interview report that uh, uh, they uh, had a general eye interest in reading books. Um, and, and that level uh, goes higher yeah, after uh, using reading battle for a while. Perhaps one last point I, I want to mention. Why, why this work? It's actually a mixture of uh, many things. Uh, 
are more than gamification. It's also about how you design the thing. So that's design science. Uh, and then we need to understand motivation psychology. And also that uh, um, the content is important. <laughs> huh. Yeah, uh, what I mean is that if you put in dumb content, really boring uh, books uh, for students to read, e even the, the platform is really good, it won't work. Huh. Yeah, so it's a mixture of many, many things, why the whole thing can work like magic for students. Huh. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, that probably sum up what I'd like to say. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Ju, for your sharing. So uh, very interesting games. So we'll have more chance to talk about it later. Then uh, next, we'll have Dr. Teresa Kwok on the stage and share her team's work at Hong Kong Baptist University. Dr. Kwok. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for staying uh, until very late in the afternoon on a Friday, which is a, a very good time uh, to have happy hour, but you stay here uh, to join us for this panel discussion. So um, today, um, the conference theme is about evidence-based, and uh, today's panel discussion is all about uh, gamification in evidence-based teaching and learning. And I will use a uh, uh, HKBU uh, project to show uh, how we use data to evidence student learning. So we'll talk about it. And this is, uh, uh, this is the outline of my sharing. I will talk about uh, what is gamification and challenge-based learning. I will briefly talk about it. And then uh, talk about the, game if, uh, the CC game cross-culture and cross-competence uh, cross-cultural and cross-disciplinary game project and the activity that we have done uh, in early this year about the UN Sustainable Development Goals International e-tournament where we collect a lot of data and how we analyze data to show evidence uh, that students are really learning. And then of course the conclusion. So I guess by now you have already known what is gamification right? After the whole days, like, oh, no, because we are talking about evidence base. Uh, you have learned a little bit from uh, Dr. Ju about what is gamification. Uh, he has a very good platform. But indeed, um, the definition is introduction of game elements, like the design techniques and mechanics to an existing information system to enhance non-game context for user engagement. It is not necessarily uh, game play, okay? But you might want to include game-like attributes, like what Dr. G said that is leaderboard, points, right? Feedback and so forth, a reward system, so that students are really learn up, like gaining like the motivation to learn better. So we call it gamification. And it is not just confined to individual learning, but also team learning. Indeed, we found more and more research papers that are talking about uh, how online gamification improves teamwork skills. So that's the reason why my project is also like looking at the collaborative uh, issue uh, on the international team. And in order to, for a team 
to work better, they need to have a very clear goals. And the clear goal might be challenge-based thing. And what is challenge-based learning is it incorporates, sorry, it incorporates problem-based learning. I guess you know what is problem-based learning or project-based learning. But the most important thing about challenge-based learning is it focuses on real-world problems or real-world issues, like what we, I will share with you about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And indeed, challenge-based learning with game-like attributes, uh, like according to the research, increase student motivation uh, towards high performance. And that's the reason why we developed or actually proposed a project and then recently, oh not recently, we got funding from the UGC in 2017 to work on a project called Developing Multidisciplinary and Multicultural Competencies through Gamification and Challenge-Based Collaborative Learning. You have a, we have a lot of elements in here and we, in short, we called it CC Game, it's easier for all of, you, all of us to remember. The CC can be cross-cultural, cross-disciplinary, and it also can be challenge-based and collaborative. So you can play around with these four Cs, mix and match, or include everything uh, in, in these Cs, okay? And this is our project team. The project team, like um, HKBU is the lead institution of this uh, cross-institutional collaborative project, and City University, Chinese U, Poly U, and Curtin University from Australia are our partners, and uh, my boss, the director of my center, Eva, is the uh, leader, and indeed, we include because it's talking about teaching and learning. We, of course, have to like, include academics from every single faculty. So we include a representative from every single faculty to the team. And this is the project objective. Is, like We would like the students to improve their learning and performance uh, by better preparing them to work in multidisciplinary and multicultural teams as well as motivating the students through the deployment of gamif uh, gamification and challenge-based learning. And we have, of course, we need to be more outcome-based, okay? Even though I'm not using the action verbs here. Uh, do you, you know, you all use like outcome-based teaching and learning. So, oh, okay, that's good. That's the same term, same language we are talking about, but then I'm not using the action verbs here. Uh, we have would like the increase of students' aspiration, advocacy, and confidence towards understanding other cultures. And then, of course, to develop and reinforce the necessary generic skills like communication, critical thinking, um, and creativity, and so forth, the, those skills to work in a global world. And the user experience and feedback on creating better ways for students to connect with international colleagues through technology-enhanced learning. And the central questions come out after like design the, the outcomes is like, can international collaborative team-based learning help students learn deeply when the digital experience is delivered as an online challenge with gaming elements, this is a central question. But how are we going to get the data? And what sorts of data we are, we should, we should collect in order to show this, to answer this question. And this, at the planning stage, we have already need to think about what sorts of data that we should collect. And these are the three outcomes that I just briefly like summarize it. And then the measures and the data sources that we might collect, like surveys, like the products submitted to the challenge platform, um, such as reflection or discussion. And then what the uh, possible analysis is quantitative analysis and visualization. And then for the impact on the knowledge and skills, the evidence of addressing or achieving the cross-cultural and cross-disciplinary uh, competencies, and the focus group interviews, and these are the uh, and to possible analysis is to, to look at to review the ar artifacts 
for the user experience, of course, it's user, user survey of, uh, and the focus group interviews, and then the qualitative uh, narrative analysis that we are going to do. This is at the planning stage, we plan. Of course, when you do the project, you have to adjust a little bit, of course. Let me use an example that we did, uh, an, an activity that we, we did uh, earlier on in this year, then you might understand more what I am talking about evidence and the data that we collected. Um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal International e-tournament was, was held um, in early uh, this year, in late January and early uh, February. It's open to all university students around the world. It's very hard, you know, uh, to recruit students <laughs> around the world to join this game. And the aim is to raise students' awareness of the sustainable development goal. This uh, learning is our focus. Learning the SDGs is, uh, is our focus. And to enable students of different disciplines and cultural backgrounds to learn to work together online as a team to complete a challenge, to complete a challenge. And these are the stages that are involved in a game. Uh, it looks very complicated, but it, it actually it doesn't. Uh, we have two stages for the students to, to play. But then before stage one, we for, help them form the team. Uh, after they registered, we, based on their originality, uh, we, form, we help them, I mean, we HKBU team, help the students to form groups of four or five with a uh, requirement that in each team, only students, like maximum two students from the same region can be in a team. So for a group of four, there are at least two, uh, two, uh, two groups of students from two different like, uh, regions. So this is a kind of like internationally, uh, we, form, we help them to form the group. So they, they have no choice. We randomly help them form the group. This is the reality when we work like in the, in the work environment, we cannot choose our, our uh, colleagues, right? So that's the reason why we help them form the group. Of course, uh, at the end, they complain. Huh? And then in stage one, we have the training of the teamwork skills, like let them know how to form a team, how to uh, set a goal and so forth. And then also let them discuss on the Moodle platform, the learning management system, how uh, they strategize the game because on stage two, they will be playing the actual game um, in it. And you will find that we will collect data at the beginning, the pre-game questionnaire, and then after that, we collect uh, the post-game questionnaire. And we also collect data in the Moodle platform, the discussion data, the discussion content, and of course, in the real game. Let me show you what the game is all about. This is a game. It's like getting the land, okay? Expanding the territory. By answering question, if, it, if the uh, answer is correct, then the student can expand their land, or they upgrade their land, or they can attack one's, one another's land to expand their territory. And then, and then like, during that game, they will find it, oh, okay, uh, I need to attack others to, to make sure that the other team's territory is smaller and smaller, and mine is bigger and bigger. Then they can win the game. So this is how they strategize at this, in stage one. And you, when you look at the data, it's actually very interesting. Let me show you, oh, this is a summary of what data we collect. The pre-post uh, uh, questionnaires, we adopt uh, the e-game flow. I'm not sure this is a, a little bit different, but I can see the constructs is like, a little bit similar, like uh, in the e-game flow and, and Dr. Ju's uh, flow, flow learning, sorry. <laughs> okay, and then we also, because we would lo look at uh, the multicultural competence, so we also adopt the global perspective inventory um, uh, as the pre and post questionnaire. And of course, we build in the feedback, um, quality feedback on the uh, questionnaire. And we have the team's discussions on stage one. And teams and individuals' performance data on Pagamo in stage two, that is the actual game. Imagine, they answer, we have a pool of a thousand questions 
in the game. So imagine every single student answer at least 500 uh, questions, how many data they can, we can generate. Um, like at least we can look at, oh, which questions, which particular questions students struggle, and which particular uh, uh, SDGs that students are more interested. You, you can, we, you, we can play a lot about um, the data. And of course, we have, uh, at the end, we have a focus group interviews with the participants. Quickly show you, we have students from 23 regions um, or uh, countries. Majority are from Asia. And this is the discussion data on stage one. I mean, we, we, we I'll put it on stage one, but during stage two, the actual game, they can still go back to the Moodle, course, uh, Moodle learning management uh, platform to discuss. At the, before the actual game starts, majority of them, when they, when they strategize the game, they will say that, attack one another, attack the others, attack the others, get lens, get lens. You know, as attacking is like palm out more frequently. But during the game itself, playing, when they go back and inside the Moodle platform and discuss, they are trying to ask, what are the answers to the questions? They try to get the, the, the answers for a particular questions. You will find that this is very interesting, from talking about how to get the lens to how to answer the questions. It's a little bit different. And you will look at this at taking others, but in the actual game, majority of them the top 10 teams, they indeed acquire lands. That is get the, get, get, the, get the lands, but not attacking others or upgrading uh, their lands. And this is the overall impression uh, uh, from the survey. The most important thing is, of course, they enjoy the game, but I would like to emphasize, emphasize this. They become more aware of the SDGs because of this e-tournament. This, I'm so pleased to look at this. Over 70% 70, uh, 70 of the students said that. And we look at the, um, the different constructs of the uh, survey, and we found that those more like engaged in the game, the top 10 teams actually have a better improvement uh, in, in the Im immersion as well as the cognitive knowledge. I think this is the last part. And we also collect the student feedback. And I would like to highlight this girl from India. Uh, she said that, I never thought I will get contacts from people from various countries, and she also said it, I never played games in my life, never showed interest in that. This is my first ever experience, enjoyed a lot, learned a lot, experienced a lot. I still feel like I am in a dream. You know, she shared a lot with us, so I, I, I'm very touched uh, at that point. And what I would like to say, this is the concluding remark, is evidence collection is essential to gamification of learning in order to measure its effectiveness. But it has to be planned ahead and before the implementation. So this is a very important thing. You need to plan ahead what data you can collect and what analysis you are going to do. So with that, these are the references. And thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Kwong. So, uh, so far we have two showcases. One is uh, reading, a more quiet activity, and the other one is strategy game. So uh, we have to ask questions about the details of the, the game later. And the last one is Mr. Watson. So uh, he will elaborate gamification and tell us the work from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Thank you. 
Hi everyone, um, thank you for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to talk here today. Um, I want to start off by giving some context about how I'm going to approach this talk, because um, I'm going to be talking more about the theory and not about a specific project. And then I want to talk more about defining what gamification is uh, and looking at what individual components can contribute to, to gamification and how we can integrate that into our course design. Also, I want to look at the impact that it can have on the student learning experiences and challenges that that throws up both for academics and for students as well. I've been a little bit ambitious in my slides, so hopefully I'll get time to talk about game-based learning. I suspect not, but we'll see, hopefully. Okay, so I'm guessing everybody knows what this image refers to. So, Pokemon Go. I joined, um, I moved to Hong Kong and joined the Polytechnic University in 2015. And Pokemon Go came out in early 2016, I think. And the reason I bring this up is because it's one of my earliest memories of being in Hong Kong. So the day that this came out, there was just groups of students just running around campus all together with a real sense of purpose and excitement trying to catch these Pokemon on their phones. And pretty much from that day forward for the next couple of months, I was getting contacted by academics saying, oh, I want to develop a Pokemon Go game for my teaching. It looks, it's great, my students love it, I want to do it for my teaching. And I'd always go back and I'd say, well, why? And they'd be like, oh, they love it, it looks cool, I want to do it. And, I, and I'll say, okay, I take that, it is, but, but why? And they never really could give me an answer. So the reason I ask these questions is because before I do my workshops, whenever I work with academics, the first thing I say is always use technology appropriately. Don't use it because it's a buzzword, because it's trendy, because your colleagues are doing it. Only ever use it if it adds value to the student learning experience. If you can see gaps in your teaching where you think, yeah, this is going to really improve my teaching and the students are going to learn more, great. But if not, just stick to the traditional methods and what you're comfortable with. So that's something that I always stress with everything, even if it's like a flipped classroom approach or even game gamification. So like I mentioned, I'm, I thought when, when I was asked to do this talk, I thought, how am I going to approach it? I'm an instructional designer, so I'm going to approach this as if you're the academics and you've come to me for advice about gamification for the first time. Okay, so I always stress that there's probably, I'd say there's three levels. There's gamification, which is quite achievable. Most people could do it. If you've got using a traditional LMS, you can achieve gamification. There's game-based learning, which is upper level again, so that's learning through games. Might take a little bit more development and assistance from people with specialist skills. And then you jump, take a big leap to it, serious games and simulation and like virtual reality. That's going to take a whole load of different skill sets and people to help you develop. So that's what I kind of start off with. Obviously, there's lots of papers out there, lots of different definitions, but they all seem to have at their core pretty much the same um, values. But I thought, okay, let's see what Google says. So gamification, typically the application of typical elements of game playing to non-game environments. And that includes point scoring, competition with others, and rules of play. Now the thing here is, I thought the second line is really interesting. So typically it was an online marketing technique to encourage engagement with a product or service. Uh, that's really interesting to me. So it was developed for marketing, not specifically for education. And I know in the UK it was very controversial. So like gambling companies were using gamification for their websites and people were getting addicted and couldn't get themselves off the site. So, so what is gamification? So it's intru intru it introduces structure and goals into learning and can be a powerful motivator if it's linked with a reward system. So teachers can use game design principles to enhance curriculum materials while helping the students learn. But I think it's really important to stress that this is meant to supplement, not replace traditional methods. So you can integrate this into your existing content. You don't have to completely develop new content. So good games present problems and challenges in a well-ordered structure. And this experience presents instructions, concepts, terminology, and feedback just in a time when it's needed. So it's that just-in-time learning, so it's always there for students as they go through the journey. So people might think, or well, I have comments sometimes, is this a new concept? No, it's not at all. So even early on in 1962, Vygotsky claimed that play is a crucial component of cognitive, cognitive development from birth through to adulthood. 
and that it's about motivation, achievement and reward. So you have to develop that motivation that is to um, gain achievement and then that achievement is rewarded. Now, how many people here used got a gold star sticker or a merit badge when they were small and in school? A couple? Well, everyone else must have been naughty in school. But, um, but yeah, so it, it starts off early on, so it's that sense of achievement and reward. So I, I got a couple and you know, I was made up when I got them. But that goes on through adulthood. So for example, I think it started with Nike Plus and now we see it with Apple, Apple Watch and Apple Health rings. You set your goals, the rings mark that you get your, your you, you reach your goals, you're rewarded after that. So it's all about sense of motivation and reward. Some people claim that social media has gamification elements, so the more likes you get, the more sense of achievement people have. I don't personally think that many likes is an achievement, but some people do. But even something more traditional, like we see scouts, if they master a skill, they get a badge. So it's showing that they've mastered this skill. So it's not a new concept at all. So uh, Carl Kapp, um, this is from a blog post in 2013. So he claims that there's two types of gamification. So structural gamification, which is the application of game elements to propel a learner through content with no alteration to the existing content. So that can be done, like the previous um, talkers have already mentioned, through the awarding of points and badges and levels also leaderboards as well, so it brings out competitive streaks in students. There's also content gamification. Now this requires developing new content, and also you can maybe look at it from different characters' point of view. So my background in the UK was in a school of nursing, and we could do this, so we looked at one situation, but we looked at it from a doctor's point of view, a, nurse, a nurse's point of view, and maybe a paramedic's point of view. So it's about... Um, digital storytelling as well. So you can look at a scenario from three different points of views. Students can actually go through the scenario and gain uh, different knowledge from different aspects. So gamification in teaching, we've already mentioned this includes badges, reward systems, progression through tasks by offering progress markers. We see this commonly now with surveys. When you complete a survey, it's got like the different steps at the bottom to, to tell you where you are in the process. That's working its way into teaching and learning as well. Um, but points, achievements, and badges can be used as extrinsic motivation to reward and archive activity. So we can also track student progress and use the data to maybe see if they need help at certain stages. So we, could, we can do that through an LMS. So extrinsic gamification, as we've already said, is adding gaming elements, but intrinsic gamification is developing the motivation and changing students' behavior. Now the images on the right you'll probably notice is Kahoot. So a lot of people probably use Kahoot in, in the room. It's a great tool and it's free. And Mozilla Open Badges as well is a really common open badge tool. But what these allow is for Kahoot specific, particularly you can have time restrictions, and that's not just time restrictions on a quiz. You can set it so it's like every, students get 20 seconds to answer a question, but as the questions get harder, they get 10 seconds. So it puts that kind of restriction on them. Like in the real world, they might have to make critical decisions within certain time frames, so it develops that skill. Point scoring as well, so the quicker they answer, the more points they get. That can be done in Kahoot. Students can also attempt a quiz individually or as a team, so you can have some problem-based learning in terms of a team point of view as well. And randomizing questions, I'm going to touch a little bit about Candy Crush later on, so there's really um, good points that Candy Crush can kind of teach us for teaching and learning. But in terms of badges, so as I said earlier, you can assign skills to a badge, so an e-badge in Mozilla. So if you think from a student's point of view, they earn a badge, they can share that on their social media and their social presence. But also for their lifelong learning, they can put that badge in their e-portfolio. So when they graduate, when they go and interview for jobs, they can say, here's my portfolio, here's all the badges, this is the skills that I've earned over my, kind of, my education. Uh, universal design. So this was a term invited, um, invented in the 50s or coined in the 50s. So this is around the design of products and environments to be usable by all people. 
But I read a really interesting paper by Rose and Mayer, and they've applied this concept for the universal design for learning. And they argue that barriers to learning are not, in fact, inherent to the capabilities of learners, but instead arise in learners' interactions with inflexible educational materials and methods. That struck a nerve with me, thinking back to my time in university. I think inflexible materials and, and methods really kind of harm me and my, my learning experience. So they claim that um, multiple ways to access content is key, and strategies for this is clear learning goals and flexible, flexible materials which allow individualized progress and, progress and ongoing assessment to ensure that goals are met. So if we think back to extrinsic gamification, we can do this by adding ga gaming elements so we can have content that's unlocked. So if you get over 80% in a quiz, for example, it unlocks more advanced content that you can go on and take. Or if you get below a certain mark and you're struggling, it will unlock more content that you could take and revisit the quiz. So we're not, get, we're not leaving students in limbo. There's no pass and fail. We continuously develop their knowledge. And you can use open educational resources for that. So you can say, OK, well done, you passed the quiz. If you want to learn a little bit more, there's some more resources you can go to. And we can do that in an LMS quite simple, quite easily. So Candy Crush, I've never personally been a fan of Candy Crush, but this paper is really interesting. So deconstructing Candy Crush. And they, the big question that they ask is if individuals are willing to spend millions of hours playing a game, how can they be motivated to instead focus their time on educational activities and solving real world problems? So we're back to flow again. So I'm really glad that it, the third time it's been, been mentioned. But yeah, they, they claim that um, the sense of flow is the, the, re, the key reason to achieve. So. Flow is where students feel focused, feel in control, and are rewarded by activity. And staying in flow requires the activity to not be too easy that people become bored, but not be too hard that they become anxious. Now, the way I interpret this is when you get in the zone, so athletes say they get in the zone, or when you're writing a paper and you get in the zone and you write a lot in a certain amount of time, that is my interpretation of flow. So, but you have to develop that through motivation as well. So they claim that um, the text in green is what Candy Crush achieves and the text underneath is what we can apply in teaching and learning. So we can chunk content into identifiable modules and submodules. So we can lock them so progress is, is released over when, with quizzes as well. Um, information is available in multiple modalities. We see that this a lot in MOOC design. So you might have your video that's three to six mi minutes long. We have some... Um, bullet point summary around that, maybe a PDF or a quiz and a discussion forum. So it's not just standalone content, it's, it's a mix of content um, together. Bonuses as well, we could add bonuses. I think it was mentioned earlier on. Maybe I'd say, okay, there's non-essential activities and there's essential activities. If you attempt the non-essential activities, maybe a discussion forum or a blog or a learning journal, you get an extra mark or an extra percent. So these are things that we can do to bring out some, some reward and achievement. And I think reflection is really important. So students can complete a section or, or like a level, if you want to use the term level in the, in the content design. And you can say, OK, well, before you move on, let's reflect on what you've learned. Complete a learning journal and reflect on the experience. I think that's really valuable. So this is an example of what I developed in when I was back in the UK. So this is just a very uh, quick game I developed in using a rapid e-authoring tool. And like I mentioned earlier on about different characters, so we had a doctor, a nurse, and a paramedic. And essentially this was patient care. So you could read a uh, ECG trace, and then you could look at um, a patient's symptoms, and then you've got three lives, you have to work your way through the levels. They get harder as you get higher in the levels. So this was just done using an e-authoring tool, and it was really quite easy to do. It's essentially just multiple choice questions with some gamification wrapped around it. So, so a colleague of mine, she's not at Polio anymore. She recently left, but she introduced me to the term gamefulness. And I was like, oh, well, I've never heard of gamefulness. What's that? And Gamefulness, essentially, and uh, the Terding is it's a really popular paper. They claim that gamefulness is, is the primary outcome of successful gamification. 
So it's a really nice term, and obviously there's something that we should be aiming for if we're adopting gamification. And it's been found to increase student engagement and enjoyment, which again, I think is really important. If students enjoy it, they're gonna be, um, have a heightened sense of achievement as well. Another study found that although gamification did not increase intrinsic motivation during a task, participants still perform better in the gamified conditions. And there's also evidence of behavioral changes, which kind of falls in line with what's already been said. Okay, just quickly, just to wrap up. So, uh, to successfully convert learning activ activity into a gameful system, learners must have a gameful experience and they must perceive the goals of the activity as non trivial and achievable. So, it has to be realistic and related to real world um, scenarios that they're learning. They must also believe that they're engaging in their own vi vi volition, they're not being forced to do it because no one wants to be forced to do it, they want to enjoy it. Uh, in either case, Inclusion of the activity may still lead to increased participation in class and subsequent changes in learning outcomes. Okay. So barriers. The first, this is from the uh, JISC, Joint Information Systems Committee, but it kind of captures everything. So barriers can be staff are nervous in adopting gamification for the first time. That can go for anything. So it's the job of people like myself to, to support them in that. We can do training workshops and we can also establish connections across universities. Students are the big thing. Students might actually associate games with their social life and not with their learning. So there may be some boundaries to cross there. Although I think today, those boundaries are a little more blurred with the use of social media for teaching as well. And also, as I said earlier, if you move towards game-based learning and simulation and virtual reality, you've got to consider costs, you've got to consider uh, software, hardware, coders who are going to develop these things, but I don't think we're going to have time to talk about that. Okay, so I'll stop there. I think I've just gone over, sorry. Um, yeah, not going to have time to talk about the rest, but thank you. So we'll invite our three speakers to come on the stage. And may I invite Dr. Victor Chen to come back on the screen and join our discussion? Okay, Dr. Chen is here. Yes. Welcome back. Yeah, thank you. So what do we do with the questions? So um, I will, am told that everyone has a QR code, right? Yes. Oh really? I'm in the, I'm in the okay, so I I don't have it. Okay, since uh, we need some time to see the questions on the Google slide, so maybe I'll ask a question first. 
Uh, my question is for David. So you have talked about uh, the technical part. So in your opinion, are all types of uh, academic courses gamifiable? Um, I'd say yes, because I always, obviously as an instructional designer, I always think of in terms of the LMS first and foremost, so learning management system. Um, so first of all, it'd be nice to get everyone using the LMS properly. And then the thing I found, and it's a slide that I didn't get the chance to look at, but researching this, this talk, I found, is there a gap between gamification and jumping more towards virtual reality and simulation? So a lot of people come to me and they want to develop something that's in virtual reality or simulation, but they've never even tried or considered gamification. So I'm like, well, let's back up a little bit and try gamification first and foremost in your existing content, see how the students respond, and then we'll put together maybe some ideas for virtual reality. But in terms of an LMS, like at Poly, we use Blackboard. On any course, you can add game, game, gamification elements, so badges, um, unlocking content, quizzes to unlock new content. So I think, I don't think it's subject specific. So I think it can be done to any, any um, subject matter. So um, it seems that is either you add some game elements in your course design, or on the very high end, you can use technologies like virtual reality and also augmented reality. Yes. I think so, but I think in terms of game-based learning, so learning through games, I think it's very common for academics to design games with the students and students to develop games for their, to, to de develop their knowledge. So if you ask a student to develop a game around World War II, their knowledge of World War II is going to increase because they're applying that to a game. A game. So I think game-based learning might be neglected a little bit, um, but I, I may be wrong. I don't know what everyone else thinks, but from my from reading open, from working with colleagues, they always jump in the deep end of the virtual reality without considering gamification or game-based learning. So, mm -hmm. Can I add a, a yes, of course. Yeah, I, I guess like uh, it ne not necessarily need a technology-based gamification. In every class, you can add a bit of like game-like element, like a competition, like forming two groups, two teams, and then uh, answering questions, compete with one another, and then you add in a reward system, something like that. It can be like this. It, not, it does not necessarily to be like very technology-based. Uh, any questions? Because I don't want to monopolize. <laughs> So I, warm I up. Uh, yes. Sorry. My name is uh, Stephen Tam from Fort Hayes State University. Uh, I have a question to um, ask Dr. Kwong. Uh, when I uh, read your PowerPoints, you mentioned that um, there are some elements, some elements for uh, gamification, okay? Uh, you, you mentioned about the design techniques, thinking, right? Um, I would like to ask about uh, um, the thinking. How would you, what do you mean by thinking? Uh, we understand that, you know, there are many different types of thinking, you know, uh, you know, uh, creative thinking, critical thinking, uh, innovative thinking, or problem solving, you know, uh, that we hope, you know, to help our students, you know. Uh, I understand that gamification, you know, uh, could be designed with different types of games, you know, to address those different types of thinking. Uh, but how well, how well does gamification do in this regard for thinking? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Can I just address me as Teresa? It's fine. Um, uh, so I, I would like to call you Stephen. It's, 
like easy. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, indeed, for our project, I, I would use my project as a base. Uh, we focus very much on problem-based learning and creativity, critical thinking and creative thinking. Uh, why we would like to have problem-based learning is, uh, is problem-based thinking is actually uh, because we would like to highlight the real world issues because we talk about the challenge based learning. So uh, we need to have some real world problems and we build in to have problem solving in it. So this is like uh, the focus. But we need to want our students to work in a team of internationally, uh, work in an international team uh, to solve the issue. So that's the reason why they need to be very creative as well, out from the international team. So this is uh, the, our focus. So we have... Uh, uh, I guess I can say a few words too. Uh, now, so uh, for gamification, um, say for the one that I showed show you earlier, huh, I, I do that at the primary school level. But even at that level, uh, we are not just gamifying the learning of the very low level things. Huh. Uh, now, so the question that I uh, that we ask uh, follow uh, pearls. Uh, pearls uh, is an uh, international reading assessment uh, being done uh, for kids uh, about uh, age nine or ten, uh, and and that assessment they have a framework of four kinds of questions. Uh, the lowest level is a fact finding. Uh, that's very easy. Uh, and then the, above that, uh, there are three other kinds. Uh, there's uh, making inferences, and then the, um, integrating ideas and then the evaluation. Huh? So oh, the others uh, have to do a lot of uh, problem solving, a lot of thinking. Huh? Uh, and, and then the, when we design questions uh, that way, uh, then students actually uh, can, can learn a, a lot more deeply regarding what they're reading. And then I also do the same thing at the university uh, for my gaming course. Uh, that, um, um, so I have a textbook uh, with about, say, 20 chapters. Uh, then me and my team will uh, just gamify create questions for the first few chapters, and then for all other chapters, uh, then I get my students uh, to create questions to challenge one another, or also uh, based on a similar framework. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah. Okay, we have a question here, also for um, Dr. Ju. Are the storybooks categorized according to the difficulty level? Do more students take challenge to read more difficult books? So do you award uh, maybe higher scores, more marks according to the difficulty of the books? Uh -huh. Now, oh, thank you for the question. Now, first of all, um, so uh, we categorize um, uh, about a little over 500 books uh, into roughly about 10 categories uh, that you saw on the home page. And then, the, and then within those uh, uh, about 10 categories, uh, then books are uh, uh, categorized into five main levels. Uh, level one will be similar to the medium uh, reading level in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, level five will be a grade five reading level. Huh? And then the, uh, regarding uh, where the student will, will get more points uh, if they uh, uh, answer books at higher level. Now, we, we, haven't done, we haven't done that because our assumption is uh, uh, with that, uh, level one to five uh, uh, books. We actually also have some books beyond level five. Uh, yeah. Now with, with that uh, design, then we find that uh, we can satisfy um, almost uh, every single uh, uh, student in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, let's say, let's say uh, for a primary three student, uh, if uh, his uh, reading level is at uh, level two, uh, then he could start at level two or even level one uh, if he want. And then uh, as he progress, then he can uh, tackle a more difficult uh, l level, huh. um, and ah, now but uh, but within each battle, uh, each challenge consists of uh, ten questions. Huh. Now, uh, question one to eight are the general question. Huh. The, the the level of difficulty is similar, mm -hmm. but level uh, but question nine and ten they are indeed more difficult. And for those questions, uh, we do give students uh, more points. Huh. Yeah, and, and then one one trick is uh, uh, now I said one to eight uh, the more general one and 9 to 10 are more difficult one, and you can get more points. So what that, what, why I designed it that way is because uh, I want students at least to work uh, 
uh, through question one to eight uh, before they can get to uh, what they regard as a, a more challenging level. Uh, in general, students do want to get to the more challenging level. Thank you, Dr. Xu. Uh, another question here. There are many parents with traditional thought that game is not a good thing. How to destigmatize and promote gamification of teaching and learning to parents? So this is for the parents. So may I ask uh, Dr. Victor Chen to say something on this question? Dr. Chen? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, just now we were talking about um, uh, a question about whether game, gamification can be applied to all kinds of learning. And, um, and the uh, discussion seems to suggest that, uh, yes, uh, of course, we can apply gam gamif uh, the uh, gamification to all kinds of learning. But I would like to offer a qualifier. I think the, uh, our, our design of our learning in the school, uh, uh, especially, we kind of we are too used to the uh, these decontextualized approach. We try to teach in subjects, not uh, instead of situating those subject knowledge in a problem solving context. Uh, gamification offer that opportunity to actually uh, simulate those kind of problem solving situations so that uh, we can pose the challenges to students and they can solve the problem and they can solve even more challenging problems. In that way, uh, problem solving games, they are all integrated together. It's not like those, uh, those kind of game that is just for entertainment, but rather it's serious games. We are challenging students to solve the problem. And once they solve the problem, they can go on to the next level of more challenging uh, games. So I think we can differentiate uh, different kinds of games for the parents. Yeah. So or we can just uh, uh, we can just frame it as problem solving rather than games. If the game is uh, over kind of uh, baggage. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Yeah. Dr. Chu. Uh, okay, now if I ask the audience, uh, who 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 doesn't play games? Any game, uh, mobile game, uh, game on computer, any any game. Who doesn't play game? No one, right? Yeah. <laughs> so actually, parents also play games. Uh, yeah. Uh, now and also that according to some uh, research, uh, uh, that uh, for for people, uh, teenagers, uh, let's say students who who play uh, Super Mario, uh, uh, every day half an hour. Uh, for a few months. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the research result shows that uh, these students are actually become uh, intellectually better, yeah. uh, rather than the worse. Uh, now, but, uh, but, 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 but the thing is, uh, if students are played too much uh, to the point of uh, addicting uh, in playing game, uh, then, then of course, uh, then that, that will bring a lot of uh, uh, bad effect uh, on, 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 on the student. Yeah, so, so what parents need to understand that is, uh, it, a uh, game is actually a good thing uh, that can bring happiness, that can bring intellectual, de intellectual development to the children. But uh, they need to help their sons and daughters not to be, get addicted to it. And also that uh, in, in, regarding g gamified platform, what we are doing is uh, we are ex kind of uh, extracting, borrowing uh, things that attract children or adults when they play game into, into the learning environment uh, to make the learning environment uh, more fun. Why not? Indeed. Uh, actually, uh, you also addressed uh, another question about if the, those students are less controlled, then they, they might be addicted uh, to the game, right? Uh, that, that's another question here. But in, indeed, I, I would like to... Sh oh, I forgot. Just flip out from my mind what I should say. <laughs> you were talking about uh, parents. parents. I suddenly forgot. Let me Can I make sorry, a point sorry. you think? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I just want to make a point as well. So we need to remember that there's, there's an educational game, so there's environmental games, so the impact of climate change through a game, um, games to support people with disabilities as well. Um, my first experience of seeing kind of serious gaming was 
when I was in the School of Nursing in the UK. Um, student nurses were using Nintendo Wii and um, Xbox Connect for manual handling, so moving patients, and also the Nintendo Wii to keep fit to be able to move patients manually. So we can't always associate gaming with, with, with fun, although obviously fun elements to it are, are important. But I think for that question as well, you could remove swap the, the word parents for academics sometimes. Sometimes, obviously, we still encounter academics who assume that students are playing games when they've got the phone out in the lectures. Not necessarily. They might be looking up a, a theory or following up on some points that have been made. So I think sometimes we need to have a little think and look at ourselves as well. So. I come back. OK. Remember. <laughs> okay, it's actually an, uh, addressing another question about uh, less control uh, students. Uh, indeed, uh, you can like think about how to design uh, your game. Uh, like if it is a gamified platform, you can you might be if there is a character, you can have an energy level until they if they have spent like. I mean, exhausted all the energy level, then the students has to stop the game, right? This is a kind of a notice that, oh, you need to stop. Every day you have like uh, 400 points of like energy level. Uh, after like attempting to like at most 100 questions, then, then you have to stop. This is a, a like at the design of the game, you need to think about it, then this is good for the less controlled students, then they, will, they might not be addicted. Another question for Teresa and Sam. Are there effective ways to identify and minimize cheating in gamification platforms? Ah, that is an interesting question. Cheating. Actually, we talk about it uh, uh, in our team about like if they are playing games uh, about talking about SDG goals, it's all multiple choice questions. How can we avoid them from searching information, searching the answer from the, from the internet? Indeed, we encourage them. In this sense, cheat, quote unquote, because if they are willing to find the answer from the internet, that means they are engaged uh, in this learning. They would like to look for more information. So this is like, I, I look at it more positively. I'm not sure whether Sam has a similar view. Okay, now for my uh, primary school platform, uh, okay, uh, there was one occasion that uh, uh, my, my project manager noticed that uh, how come the user uh, uh, were answering on the platform in the middle of the night? Uh, we are talking about 2 a.m. Uh, in the morning. Yeah, uh, it must be done by the parent. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, um, so so for for some for some parents uh, in Hong Kong, yeah, they 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 are very crazy. Huh? Uh, that uh, they want their kids uh, uh, to be top in everything, uh, including on a gamified platform. Yeah, and so, uh, so uh, and so some parents would indeed. Huh, uh, I I think huh, I have done something uh, on on my platform. Um, uh, uh, I, I won't be surprised. Huh? So what we need to do is uh, we need to do parent education. Yeah. Huh? So um, in one of uh, such sharing uh, with hundreds of uh, parents and children, I would I would say, uh, by the way, um, if if any parents who have done a lot of work, uh, will you come out? Yeah, we will give you an award. Yeah, uh, because you've done such a marvelous job. Yeah. Now, but then I tell tell them that. Uh, but in fact, uh, uh, this is not very good for your children. Yeah, because if you want them to learn, then uh, don't don't help them. Uh, yeah, uh, unless uh, they come to you for help, uh, yeah, yeah, then you discuss with them. In fact, uh, that uh, that actually improve parent-child relationship uh, because uh, in, in most uh, um, uh, parent supervising children's situation, uh, that um, children are not very happy. Yeah, uh, they're kind of forced to do many things. But then in this gamified platform, it's the other way around. Uh, when we uh, uh, let children do it voluntarily. Uh, then the, when they need help, they will go to the parent, and then that actually uh, has, can, 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 can bring many good things, not just uh, 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 intellectual development, also parent-child relationship. Now at the university, yes, there are children, uh, there are students who also cheat. Um, now, but then the students will, will, will cheat anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, in any, uh, any learning management system. Yes, so uh, uh, we, 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 we just need to uh, let the student know that uh, uh, well, if they want to learn, they have to do it on their own. And interestingly, uh, I find that uh, 
uh, uh, with my Game Five platform, uh, actually students work a lot harder. What I mean by that is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, about one third of my, my students they actually do a lot more than the uh, than what they require to get the top score. Yeah, uh, because they find pleasure of uh, uh, answering questions on the Game Five platform. I want to add a bit. It's not because I said that the cheating is, is correct. It's like it really depends on the nature of the learning or the assessment. If you are uh, thinking of like having the gamification platform or gamification of learning uh, and have a summative assessment that is towards the final grade, then of course you need to think of a way that to avoid that kind of cheating. But if it is like you treat it as a formative feedback to give students to test their understanding, then I guess it's like you, you, you can view it differently. So we have uh, maybe a, a last question. Uh, this is a really quick one. Is there open platform for gamification in education in Hong Kong? Like encourage players to contribute in enhancement of the platform or the game. So any platform in Hong Kong? So people can actually... No, not that I know of, no. Um, our School of Design... Sell, sell by Fredlin. Um The sell game. Possibly. Um, our School of Design develops serious games, so they do a lot of uh, great work in developing like environmental games as well, uh, brain training games. Um, but in terms of open source platform, I'm not aware of one. Not, not necessarily, not uh, on AI learning. Uh, perhaps I can say a few words. Okay, now my, my platform, a Reading Battle, uh, uh, it's quite open in the sense that anyone in the entire world actually uh, can contact my team and then uh, get an account or get accounts for all of their st everyone in their school. Huh? And so it's open in that sense. And the second question is uh, encourage player to contribute. Yes, uh, we do. Uh, we, we, we do, um, uh, for, for example, in two levels. One is uh, in terms of books. Uh, um, in the past two years, I actually, m my team actually co collaborated with uh, primary school students. Uh, in co-authoring more than 30 books, and, and, and those books become content uh, on my platform. And, and interestingly, actually, uh, many of those books are of very high uh, quality and also very welcome by, by the children. And also that uh, many people contribute in the sense that, that they contribute questions, quest creating questions for some of the books. Uh. And regarding AI, uh, not yet, but uh, I am writing a couple of proposals uh, to AI uh, my platform. Yeah, if there's any uh, AI machine learning expert here, uh, if you are interested in this, uh, please contact me. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this very fun and interesting discussion today. And also thank you, Dr. Chen in Singapore. So goodbye for now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.